This evening we're going to look at, uh, I think, three relatively uh, familiar verses. I, I hope they're familiar. If you've read the uh, Gospel of, uh, actually not the Gospel of John, but the uh, first letter of John, uh, it is a very challenging letter that um, gives us many different ways by which we might know whether we're believers or not. And this is um, probably one of the most potent ones in uh, 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. Let me just go ahead and read that as we begin. John writes, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. I think it is interesting that um, we come to this particular passage at a time when we have uh, a number of youth. We had virtually none this morning, but we did have some uh, that weren't able to make it to the snow rally. <laughs> but um, this is one area where uh, you're going to be challenged perhaps more than any other in everything you face in life because the world is the one thing that's going to stand in your way between you and serving the Lord just because it, it looks so good, it looks so like it's so much fun, there's so many things to, uh, you can get involved in, so many accomplishments and so forth to make. You want to make your mark, you want to become rich and famous. I mean, that's how everybody seems to start off in this world. But actually, those are the things that are going to stop you from being what the Lord wants you to be. And the sooner you can learn that lesson, the more effective you're going to be in serving the Lord. And actually, that's what this series has been about, putting off sin, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. As uh, Paul says in Romans, that we are to make no provision for our flesh with regard to its lusts, but we are to put on Jesus Christ. We are to become like him. We are to live like him in this world. And really, in order to do that, there are several things that we need to do. As a matter of fact, uh, we start off by looking at the reasons why we should do this uh, the Lord has certainly given us many, uh, all of his, his love, all of his provision, the fact that he sent his son into the world to die for our sins and gives us eternal life by faith in his name is certainly a very powerful positive reason. But there's also a negative reason. If we don't put off our sins and put on Christ, the Bible says that we're going to die. As a matter of fact, um, it says we're dead already because if we are Christians, that's what we're going to want to do. We've also looked at what it means to put on Christ and what it means to make no provision for the flesh, exactly what it says. Uh, the Lord doesn't want us to indulge in any sin. Everything has to go. Everything that is against what God wants. We can't allow room for any of it. Any of it is going to strengthen sin in our hearts and it's going to make it difficult, if not impossible, to overcome them. We have to cut them all off. At the same time, we need to put on everything the Lord calls us to put on. We need to uh, obey the Lord universally across the board. Now, as we've been looking at why we should do it and what it actually means, we've started looking at how we are to do this. And last week, we saw the key. And the key is love. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Putting on Christ is keeping his commandments. And to the degree that we love him, to that degree, we're going to obey him. I mean, our obedience is going to go no further than the love that we have for him, which is why God says in, well, to the church um, in Laodicea, I want you to be hot don't want you to be cold. I don't want you to be lukewarm. To be lukewarm, he says, makes me sick. To be cold means you're not a believer at all. Of course, to be lukewarm means you aren't either. But he wants you to be hot. He wants you to be zealous for him. He wants you to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, thankfully, no true believer can be lukewarm. That's uh, something perhaps we didn't focus on last week, I think gentleman who was visiting with us seemed to have some difficulty with that, but I hope you understand that that is true. No Christian can be lukewarm because the Lord says, Jesus says, if you are lukewarm, 
I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. He would never do that for any of his children because he loves them. But let's not forget that Jesus actually did address this to a church, a, a group of people that were professing faith in him. And he says, I, you are lukewarm, and I don't want you to be lukewarm. If you continue in that state, this is what's going to happen, which means either that they weren't true believers or they had fallen into a condition that really did turn the Lord's stomach, and he was warning them to get out of it. This is not what the Lord wants us to be. So make sure that you are not lukewarm. You know, if being half-hearted with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of heaven makes the Lord sick, then you should do all that you can to avoid that and grow in your love for him. Now again, to be hot means to be intensely in love with the Lord. And you know what it means to love something. When you love someone, when you love something, you're... Your, your mind is focused on it, your heart is focused on it, your life is focused on it. You can't do anything without thinking about it. You've got to have it. You've got to pursue it. You're not, you can't rest until you have it. Well, that's exactly what the Lord wants. He wants you to be hot for him. He wants you to have that kind of zeal for him. Now, in order to have that, you need to have two things. You need to be Stoking the furnace of that love in your heart by using the means of grace. And you need to stop, as the illustration has already been given, stop pouring water on that flame uh, by sinning against the Lord. You know, I hadn't uh, thought of this until just this evening, but as we've been going through Pilgrim's Progress, remember when Pilgrim stopped in Interpreter's house? And the interpreter was giving him all these different, or showing him these different rooms that each had a spiritual lesson. In one room, there was a, a man who was standing in front of a fire, and he was pouring water on the fire. But the fire wasn't going out. As a matter of fact, the, wire, the, the fire continued to grow hotter and stronger. And uh, Christian, wondering how that could be, the interpreter shows him that behind the wall was standing a man who was continually feeding oil into the fire to keep it going. Satan's trying to put out the fire. Christ is the one who keeps it going. And that's to remind us that Satan can't put the fire out because Jesus is the one who keeps it burning. He's not going to stop giving you provision of his spirit. He's going to keep that fire alive. But that doesn't negate the fact that Satan is trying to put it out. He's trying to pour water on the fire. And this evening, what I want us to look at is the main source of that water that he uses to try to quench that flame of love in your heart, and that is the world. So I want us to look at three things this evening from this passage. The first thing is what the world is. Secondly, the warning that you must not love the world. And then thirdly, we do need to understand that to the degree that you love the world, to that degree that you compromise with the world, to that degree your love is going to be weakened, and you are going to be that much less useful to the Lord and spiritual. So first of all, what, what is the world that John's talking about here? Well, I think you know it isn't the world in, in the one sense that we think of the world, which is the world in which we live, the creation. I mean, really, the creation is good. Even though it's marred by sin, it's still good. As a matter of fact, it does things for the Lord that um, are very useful. For one thing, it reveals God. It shows us that he exists. It shows us what he is like. As a matter of fact, the, the uh, revelation that God gives to us in the creation is so clear, there is no one in the world who has an excuse for not believing in God. Everyone is accountable to him strictly on the basis of the fact that God has revealed himself in his creation. So it must still be good. And that means there's nothing wrong with getting out in nature and seeing the, the glory of God. I mean, many of you were just out there, weren't you, in the snow, uh, playing in the snow and seeing some of those things um, on the mountains and Sonora and so forth. You saw something of the glory of God. We need to be thankful that there's snow. I mean, it may have been fun to play on, but it also serves a useful purpose. It adds to the water table, and we have water in our faucets because of that, so it's a good thing. But you do need to be careful when you're out in the creation that the curse that has affected it doesn't get you while you're out there that you don't 
get mixed up in poisonous plants, you know, there's poison ivy and poison oak, things like that. Some of us realize that there's parasites and some of the bugs that can get to you and that can make you sick. And there's some animals that are dangerous. So the creation still reveals the glory of God, but we do need to realize that there are some dangerous things in it. But realize that that's not what John's talking about, obviously. So what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the things that Satan has basically woven into our society, into the world, and three things in general. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Now, you know, as Christians, the Bible says we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, the flesh, of course, is that corruption that's inside of us, that desire to, to want to sin. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have any problem. We'd be like Jesus. We could go through the world, and though we might be tempted, it's not going to bother us because we won't have any desire for those things. Satan, as you know, is that malignant spirit, that evil spirit that rebelled against God who desires nothing more than to destroy you. But I think sometimes we forget that the main tool that Satan uses to try to destroy you, to try to tempt you into doing things that, that are sinful and against God's will, is he uses the world. So that's what we want to focus on, is the world, that main thing that Satan uses to try and destroy you. So what are the things that Satan has woven into the society to try to tempt you, to try to stumble you, to try to destroy you? Well, again, we've read what those are. The lust of the flesh is the first one. And those are the things that Satan presents to you in this world to satisfy your fleshly desires or to appeal to the sin that's inside of you. Uh, your lusts, those things that God actually forbids, as well as uh, things that really are good but can be wrong if they're misused. I think we're all familiar with the things that God tells us not to do. I mean, they're clearly revealed in the Ten Commandments. He tells us don't be idolaters. Don't worship false gods. Don't worship God in a false way. Don't blaspheme God. Don't use his name in vain. Uh, don't break your vows. Don't break the Sabbath day. Uh, don't, of course, rebel against authority. Don't hate other people. Don't injure other people. Certainly don't murder other people. Avoid sexual uncleanness, fornication, adultery, homosexuality. Don't steal. Don't lie about others. Don't covet what others have. Let's just stop there for a minute and examine the world in which we live. Doesn't this sound like a description of the world? Everything that God says not to do isn't that exactly what the world and the people in it are doing? Perhaps even some of those people that we admire. And there's, there's not only the things that God forbids, but there's also the good things that God gives to us that can be abused. I mean, food is good, but too much food is gluttony. Wine is good, but too much wine is drunkenness. Recreation can be good, but too much recreation is slothfulness. Satan basically has spread out a banquet. Think of the, of, the, of the world as like a banqueting table, and Satan has put on the table all these different things that he knows are going to appeal to your lustful desires. That's what the world is. Now, that's just the lust of the flesh. He also says the lust of the eyes are very much a part of it. And what those are are the things that, that Satan uses as a fisherman as he's fishing for you. Satan likes to bait his hooks with things that he knows are going to appeal to you, things that perhaps promise some kind of pleasure but lead you away from God. And again, in our society, perhaps the, the, the greatest uh, bait that Satan can use is a pretty face or a shapely body uh, money, things that sparkle. Uh, he's a very good fisherman, and he knows how to bait his hooks, and that's what he uses, the things that he knows are going to tempt us. 
And of course, there's also the third part, which is the boastful pride of life, and that's the things that appeal to your pride. The desire for fame and fortune, for people to look at you, for, to, to admire you, and to remember you. You know, in Jesus' day, he had some wonderful examples of that that were around for everybody to look at, and those were the scribes and Pharisees. Those were the ones when they went to a, a banquet, they would always take the places of honor because they wanted people to think that they were honorable and that they should honor them. They wanted position, they wanted power with the Romans, and they were willing to make any compromise necessary to get these things. Satan had them snared with position, with this honor that they desired. Now this is the world. It's not just the world that Jesus lived in, it's the world that we live in, it's the world that exists now. It really hasn't changed a whole lot since those days. We could actually argue it's become much worse. So that's what the world is. Now secondly, John warns you that you must not love the world. Now why must you not love the world? Well, because it can destroy you. And as a matter of fact, if you love it, it will. Because if you love the world, John says, the love of the Father is not in you. These two cannot exist together. If you don't love the Father, you don't love the Son. And if you don't love the Son, then you will perish. Now, we do have to be careful here because uh, John is not really speaking in absolute terms. I mean, do you not love the Father at all if you love the world even a little? Well, no, that's not true because John understands that Christians still struggle with sin. Christians uh, are tempted by the world and certainly the corruption that is inside of us will make us desire the world to one point or another. But what John is saying is that if you are so enamored with the world and so in bondage to that love for it that you consistently go after the world. That's what your life is all about. That's what you're chasing. That's what you desire and want. Then you're basically practicing sin. And those who practice sin aren't Christians. The Bible says that no one who's born of God practices sin. The children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. The one who practices sin is of the devil. The one who practices righteousness is born of God. Which means that if you're a Christian, you cannot consistently desire the world and chase after it. You may have a desire for it, but you're going to be fighting that desire because your love for the Lord is going to be stronger. And that is you. That is uh, the new man, the new nature that wants God most of all. A true believer practices righteousness. They do what's right. They love the Father and fight against that desire. Uh, they realize that what the world offers, what it's all about, is really contrary to God. It's opposed to the kingdom of heaven. I mean, the Christian knows that what God desires of you is to be filled with the Spirit of God, to be filled with a holy love for Him, not a lust after the things of the world that God hates. They know that they have to have their eyes set on heaven and to be heading there, not looking at the golden baits, as, uh, as it were. Thomas Brooks, in his uh, book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, again, is the one who comes up with this analogy. The Satan is a fisherman, and he puts his baits on his hook, the baits he knows that are going to tempt you. He calls them the golden baits, and here we are playing with the golden baits. We have our eyes looking at, at that instead of looking at heaven. The Christian knows that God wants us to look at heaven. And that's where we look, not at the golden bait. Satan dangles in front of our eyes trying to uh, hook us so that he can reel us into hell. They know that the Lord wants us to put on humility, that that's what the kingdom of heaven is about, the one who humbles himself to become the slave of all, not pride, not trying to get the world to look at us and to serve us, but rather becoming nothing that we might exalt Christ and that we might serve others. The kingdom of heaven and the world are opposed to each other. The Christian wants to honor the Lord. He doesn't want to go the direction of the world. Now, G uh, John says that if you love the world, if that's really what's in your heart, if that's really what you want above the things of the Lord, 
that when the world passes away, you are going to pass away with it. In other words, it will destroy you. But if you love and serve the Lord, you will live forever. He who does the will of the Father will live forever with the Lord. So if you love the Father, you will not love the world. But now let's get back to this other point. We realize that it's true that a Christian is not going to be one who loves the world above everything else and seeks that to the exclusion of the Lord and compromises with it continually so that they're practicing sin. But a Christian is still going to be tempted to go after the things of the world because of the sin that is inside of us. And the point that I wanted to make this evening is, is basically this, to the degree that you love the world and go after the world and compromise with the world, to that degree you are going to be weakened spiritually. And of course, if you're a true believer and you want to grow into Christ's likeness, if you want to put off your sin and put on Christ, you can't afford to let that happen. Now, it's true that you can't habitually, consistently go after the world, but again, you can be deceived and tempted by it. And sometimes we just really don't realize how much desire we really do have for the world and how much we rationalize the desire that we have. That's one of the Satan's devices, again, in Thomas Brooks' book. We paint vice with virtue's colors. In other words, we cover over it and we say, this is really a good thing that I'm doing. It's not bad to seek after this part of the world. But the fact is, it is still the world and it's still going to hurt you. Well, let me just ask you, I mean, how many times have you found yourself looking at somebody in the world and wanting to be like them? Wanting that fame, wanting that fortune, wanting to have what they have, wanting that talent so that others can look at you? Or having what they have? even though what they are and what they have is really not what the Lord wants us to have. It's not what he wants us to be. You know, this is something that was almost, seems like ubiquitous, if I can put it that way. It's widespread among parents. If you were to ask even just a generation ago, it's probably the same today, what parents want for their children. Well, I want them to grow up and be famous. I want them to grow up and be rich. I want them to be a doctor, a lawyer. I want them to be president or whatever it may be. But how many do you, uh, parents do you actually hear say, I want my, my child, my son or my daughter to grow up to be a humble and useful, godly servant of Christ? I don't think we often hear that because the world is tempting us. We think that it's okay, it's good. And so we flirt with it. Now the world can't destroy you if you're a Christian, but does it matter that you flirt with the world? It can't destroy you, that's true. But isn't it true that it can rob you? Rob you of something very precious by quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit? Now we've already seen that you're only going to obey the Lord as far as your love is going to take you. And the measure of that love we're talking about is really determined by how much of the Spirit of God is in your heart how much you are under his control, how much you were filled by him. The measure of the spirit that you have is going to be determined by your pursuit of the things of the Lord. I mean, when, when Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, what he means is that you need to be working along with the Lord, doing certain things to increase that love of God in your heart. But it's also going to be determined by how much you quench and grieve the spirit of God. Now, on the one hand, we're, we're feeding ourselves on the means of grace. We're hearing things this evening that can provoke us, that can build us up in holiness. But on the other hand, we're going to go out the rest of the week and we're going to be compromising with the world and we're going to lose that influence. Now, how much can you flirt with the world and not lose what the Spirit of God is doing in your heart? Actually... You really can't flirt with the world at all and not expect to lose something. I've already described to you, or John's described to you, what the world is like. But listen to what James says in James 4, verse 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? 
Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And I would say generally the people, again, that we look at and we're tempted to be like are friends of the world. They are the world. And if we embrace that, if we embrace that lifestyle, if that's what we seek after, that fame and that glory and so forth, for our own you know, good, as it were, we're actually making ourselves the enemy of God. And that's one of the reasons why those who may have started off well ended up falling away from Christ. If you indulge your flesh at all, if you flirt with the world at all, you offend the Spirit of God. You grieve Him. You quench Him. You lose His influence. The world is going to rob you of love for that reason. And it will weaken your obedience. I don't know if, if many of you read um, some of the biographies you know, that have been written about some of the great saints of God, but have you ever wondered why we don't see people like that today? Or why there's so few like those saints of old? Why it is that we struggle ourselves with love in our own hearts for the Lord? Why it is that when the people of God are meeting together to worship the Lord, those services are poorly attended or why there's so few at prayer meetings seeking after the Lord and even fewer who are fasting? Well, the world is one of the main problems. Maybe we stayed home to watch television. Or maybe there's some sporting event that's going on. Or maybe we're just too tired. We just don't have the, the love, the affection that we want to, to come to the service. Well, why are we like that? Why, especially when we consider everything that the Lord has done for us. The fact that he has given us his son, I mean, if you really believe that, that's a gift of infinite value. He saved you from hell. He's loved you with an eternal and infinite love. Why isn't that enough to move your hearts to do what God calls you to do? Well, again, the world and flirting with the world and desiring the things of the world is one of the main problems. It's stealing spiritual power and desire. Now, again, Satan is very subtle. And we may not even see what it is he's doing. We may not realize that's what it is. We need to have a way that we can tell the difference between what is good and what is bad, what we're doing that's helping us and what we're doing that's actually hindering us and quenching the spirit. I keep coming back to this principle that Susanna Wesley taught her children, John and Charles Wesley, who were actually very... Um, Great saints of the Lord, very productive, very useful. We're still singing Charles Wesley's hymns. They're probably some of the best hymns uh, ever written. Why was he able to do that? Why was John able to write all that he wrote and preach all the places that he preached and do all that work he did for the Lord? Well, I think it was because they took to heart the advice their mother gave them while they were growing up, plus the fact that uh, certainly they trusted in the Lord and God gave them this grace. But this is... This is what she said to them. And listen to this carefully. She says, Whatever weakens your reason impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, takes off your relish for spiritual things. Whatever increases the authority of the body over the mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may seem. In itself. Now again, I don't know if you got all of that, but I hope you got the gist of what she was saying. Basically, if you do something, and that something takes away any or all of your spiritual zeal, whether it seems innocent or not, it's not good for you. It is sin, even if the Bible says it isn't actually sin. I had a, uh, a professor in the college I went to also point out the scripture that says whatever is not of faith is sin. If you don't know for sure that this is what God allows you to do, if you have some doubt in your mind that this might be sin and you do that thing, it's still going to hurt you. It's still going to quench the spirit, even if it might not be. He used the example of a chocolate milkshake. There's nothing wrong with a chocolate milkshake as long as you're not just first drinking them all day, every day. But if you think it's sinful to drink a chocolate milkshake and you drink a chocolate milkshake, then you are sinning. Even if it's something that is innocent, if you believe it's wrong, you need to stay away from it. 
Now, we usually don't evaluate the things that we do by this particular standard. We usually ask the question, is this song that I'm listening to, is it fun? You know, do I enjoy it? Is it fun to do these things that I'm doing? Do they make me feel good? And do I have a good time doing it? That's what we think about. Am I, am I having fun? Is it pleasurable? And we don't often think about whether or not what we're doing is actually bringing us closer to Jesus or driving us away from him. Whether this thing makes us more like Jesus or less, whether it honors him or dishonors him, whether it pleases the Holy Spirit who lives in my soul or quenches and grieves the Spirit of God. Really, I think we would all do well to examine our hearts after we do the things that we typically do and ask ourselves the question, am I closer to God? Do I love him more or do I love him less? I think you'll find that oftentimes the things that you do, that you love him less, those are the things that have to go. Compromising with the world, and that's what we're talking about, the things of the world. Everything that is not of God is of the world. And everything in the world is going to quench the spirit of God. It's like pouring water on that fire. The fire that I hope you want to, to glow more brightly and to be stronger so that you can serve the Lord and honor him the way that, well, if, if you've made public profession of your faith in churches, you have said that's what you want to do. And you actually have promised that you're going to um, fight against the flesh and the world and seek to live a godly life. If you really meant that, then this is something you'll want to pay attention to. The more you compromise with the world, the weaker his love is going to be in your heart. The weaker you're going to be spiritually, the more you're going to struggle in your Christian walk the more you're going to waste time in your life doing things, as I mentioned before, only the things you do for the Lord are the things you're going to be able to take out of this world. Everything else you do is just flushing it down the drain, and it's gone forever. The more you compromise with the world, the more you're going to be sorry at the end of your life that you have, and the more shame you're going to feel on the Day of Judgment. Thankfully, after the Day of Judgment is over, there won't be anything but happiness, but on the day of judgment, if you've wasted your life flirting with the world, do you think you're going to be happy you did? That day is going to come. And when you see, as we saw this morning, you know, that our lives uh, are basically pictured in Scripture as, as though we're, we're building these different structures. The Bible says that we can build structures that are made of nothing but worthless, burnable material, wood, hay, and stubble. Or we can build it with things that will last, like gold, precious stones, and jewels, and so forth. And then on that day, the fire is going to reveal the quality of each person's work. The question is, if your life goes up in flames and there's nothing left, and even though you're saved by fire, are you going to be happy about that? Or would you rather that there be something left there uh, to receive a reward for? that gives glory and honor to the Lord. Well, to the degree that you compromise with the world, to that degree you're building your life is basically being made of wood, hay, and stubble that's all going to go up in flames on that day. But those things that you devote to the Lord are the things that are going to remain, the things you're going to be rewarded for. And again, I think all of us on that day, if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, would rather that we didn't compromise and didn't flirt with the world, but instead devoted ourselves to the Lord's service. So the point of, the, of this is basically this. Don't let Satan rob you any longer through the world. Fight against worldly desires. Open your eyes. See the world as it actually is. It's not good. It is evil. Most of what we see going on is evil. And even though, again, it may be fun to do and fun to listen to, there are things in it that aren't so good. Even the songs, I was looking at the lyrics of a song recently, and again, it's lyrics of a secular artist, and maybe you know some of the song might be okay, but it's got bad lyrics in it, bad language, bad ideas, things that you really don't want in your mind. Should you really listen to those things? Should you really compromise with those things, especially if you're enjoying it? Should you really enjoy that kind of stuff? 
you know, even those songs that basically don't maybe, you know, have anything that's really bad in it, but they leave God entirely out of the picture. And it just presents to you a worldview that, that has no God. I mean, is that really a good thing to listen to? Or would it be better to listen to something that actually is going to glorify God, that's speaking his truth and that's drawing your heart out after him? Again, examine your heart and see what you feel when you're done. Do I feel closer to the Lord, or is this thing that I'm doing choking the love of God in my heart? Don't let Satan rob you. Open your eyes, turn away from the world, and pursue the Lord through the means of grace. If you devoted your time instead to using what the Lord has given you to seek him and serving him in the way that he calls you to, you would be stronger rather than weaker. And I have to mention again that two of the most powerful means that God has given to us is prayer, or our prayer, and fasting. This, oper this Friday we're going to have the opportunity to seek the Lord in fasting with his people and to pray on Saturday with them. Now the world is going to try to rob you of the blessing you might otherwise have if you actually in engaged in that, if you actually did it, if you fasted and if you prayed. If you're able to, again, again, health permitting, if the Lord allows you to do that. And if health doesn't permit, you can still pray and gain a blessing by doing that. The world is going to try to get you not to do that. Satan is going to try to stop you from doing that. Your flesh is going to stand in your way, and it may be successful with a number of you. But you need to purpose in your heart to see what they're trying to do, to know that they're trying to stop you from doing something that's good and it's going to be helpful, and you need to purpose in your heart by God's grace to do that if you can, to fast if you're able, to pray. And I don't say if you're able, if you are living and breathing and you're in your right mind, you're able to do that. So you can pray. So ask God to give you the grace to move forward, to experience those benefits, to stoke that furnace in your heart and not to quench it by, again, allowing the world and your flesh to overcome you. I mean, you're not only going to see the blessings of that decision in this life, uh, in increased spiritual strength to do what I hope you want to do, which is serve the Lord, but you're also going to have greater rewards in heaven. One thing we forget, I think, very often is we only have one life to live. We only have so much time. And you can either let the world continue to steal it from you, or you can use it to serve the Lord and reap the benefits spiritually in this life and in the life to come. May the Lord give us the wisdom to do what we often say with, you know, in our words, this is what we want to do. Oh, yes, I love the Lord. Yes, he means everything to me. Yes, I love him more than anything else. And yet, does, does our life really show that that's true? Let's not just say it. Let's actually live it and have a real kind of love that is going to make a difference, not only for us personally, but also for others, for the kingdom of heaven, for this world. Uh, again, the Lord has many servants, but very little service. And the reason why there's so little service is because so many of the servants really don't love the Lord the way they should. If you love the Lord, you will want to do his will, and his kingdom will move forward. Your obedience is only going to go as far as your love, and you're not going to love him very much if you continue to compromise with the world. So learn what John is trying to encourage you this evening, what your Lord is actually telling to you through the Apostle John. Do not love the world or the things of the world. Stop compromising with it. Maybe it can't destroy you because you're a believer, but it can rob you blind, and you do not need to let it do that. Don't let it steal from you any longer, but turn away from it. And... Stoke again the fires of your heart with the means of grace. Grow strong in the Lord and do great things for him. That's really what life is all about. And that's what I hope all of us will have wanted to do when we stand before the Lord on that day. So keep thinking about that day. It has really, a, a, I think, a very purifying effect on our lives. Think about the day you have to stand before him. Think about the kind of life you wish you had lived and live it now, 
Don't put it off to the future. Don't let the world continue to take away your time. Satan is always going to find reasons for you not to use your youth to do this. And as you get older, he's going to give you reasons why you shouldn't use the rest of your life for it either. You've got to stop listening to him and begin listening to what the Lord tells you to do. Well, may God give us the grace to listen and to do what he says this evening. Let's um, bow for a moment of silent prayer and ask the Lord to apply, help us apply this.